everybody, this is Pat Windrow again at the Cable Easel with a program devoted to painting and drawing from life. I say that all the time and I think I'll stop saying it because it's becoming tiresome. Anyway, uh, this is part two of a study of one of the favorite places on Long Island called the Cap Tree Bridge. Uh, I had a little dissertation in part one about what bridges and mankind do and um, I suppose I'm, I think I probably won't repeat it but bridges are one of my very favorite uh, subjects to paint because they are usually near water and being a water painter and have been for a very long time I kind of gravitate towards those places where there is water and in order to be able to get to water more than likely you sometimes have to cross a bridge and some bridges are more beautiful than others, but this one seems to be one of the more interesting structures. It's almost uh, half a century old. Uh, Robert Moses um, uh, is responsible for a great deal of the parks areas here on Long Island, and he did that back in the 50s. And this bridge was completed in 1954 which may or may not be of interest, but I think that we take for granted these things that we use so constantly that we don't realize how long they've been in service and how actually remarkable and how identifiable they are of a particular region. And I think that to anybody who knows the Long Island has at one time or another been taken across this bridge uh, because it leads to one of the favorite places here for recreation, namely Long Island, uh, Fire Island, and Jones Beach, and, and um, the uh, banks across the Great South Bay. So, having prepared this uh, painting, uh, here is the background, uh, uh, ribbons of color uh, to prepare for the uh, rendering of this uh, rather remarkable steel bridge. It is a span, uh, which of course has a suspension area in the middle, and there's a lovely archway in between made at this particular angle. Other angles, when you see it profile, it is just the great sweep. Here, uh, at this angle, uh, you get what I call uh, a, a rather beautiful shape of this, of this um, uh, well, it's a go to me, it's a gothic angle. Uh, it doesn't mean to be gothic, but at this particular uh, perspective, it becomes a gothic angle. And um, here is uh, here's what I'm talking about. So now that I've prepared this, I'm using just a, a tinted sort of a dark tone to try to get the uh, d try to get the architectural details of this of this structure. Um, you see uh, two of them, and. They, uh, uh, of course, I think I better do the span first b before I get into deep trouble. The span, of course, begins way over in the landmass and it curves very slightly. It's a very gentle curve going from the left side of the painting to the right, obviously, and it, it appears to be flat, but it really is slightly curved because it is going over a sort of a, 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 it is going into the distance and causing a horizon problem, and causing a um, a uh, the curve that you see of the Earth when you're in an airplane. You don't see it down here, but when you have a span this long, you will you will get the illusion or the illusion of a curve. The bridge is, of course, I believe, flat. Uh, in many instances, but this perspective will give you the illusion of a curve. Well, here is the span, and uh, in the center, and I've placed this dead center of the painting, which a lot of people would say is a no-no, but I think that when you do the, the, do the study, you may as well call attention to it. I'm using a striping brush, reduced very way down with a lot of turpentine so that I can get almost a pencil out of it, and 
I'm trying to draw this bridge just as, as I see it, but not as if it were an architectural rendering. Uh, that was all done on the drawing boards a very long time ago. All I'm trying to do is to get a general feeling of what this structure is. is got, it's, got, it's got triangles like this in it. And it's uh, and and it's uh, it's uh, the 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 structure has got probably a very definite term, but I'm just calling it uh, diamonds and and triangles. Uh, when you do a when you do an architectural rendering of anything, it is uh, it is wise to try to understand what the architecture is, but it's also w wise to try and make it an artistic adventure rather than a um, rather than a technical one. Uh, the technical ones are okay, but they t tend to take away from the general aesthetics of a um, of a of a pretty thing, uh, such as this bridge is. Uh, anybody who's gone over, that's not smooth enough. I'm going to take that out with my with my palette knife. I I made it too sharp, and so you are here to witness how you make corrections uh, right on the spot because um, there's no question that mistakes can be made and will be made when you're working. Uh, from life and when you're working with an architectural detail. So if that curve was a little bit too pointed, I'm, I want to cover it up and, and, and make it less. Uh, this is also a remind you that this is not expected to be what you would call an absolutely finished painting. This is a demonstration. And the demonstrations, of course, are going to, are going to have uh, the need to be cleaned up and refined later. Uh, here is the general uh, wonderful uh, feeling about the structure of this, of this bridge and the painting is the paint is still a little bit wet because I used it extremely thick but uh, the close-up, when you're there, you can of course focus. Now there are some verticals, uh, there are some very hard, strong verticals that come down and this is the pattern. The triangles are interrupted by the verticals and uh, the general feeling about this bridge is, oh this goes perfectly straight across here, isn't that fascinating? Eh, well, alright. So, and then come the pilings. The pilings are, of course, a, a, an important part of the rest of the span. The middle part is really fascinating, but the pilings uh, are, are also uh, need to be to make some sense because they're supporting a very large structure. The um, they are made of cement, uh, obviously, and uh, st and reinforced steel, and they uh, are anchored and into the water uh, on the, uh, in structures which are uh, probably similar to what was found out when the Brooklyn Bridge was built by Mr. Roebling uh, a long time ago, at the turn of the century, a hundred years ago. They celebrated a hundred years of the Brooklyn Bridge just a little while back. And uh, these, these pilings, of course, are sunk in, in uh, some rather turbulent water. So there must be some extraordinary en engineering feat taking place to get these things anchored into, first of all, what must be shifting sand, and secondly, which, um, an area which uh, uh, has experienced some rather violent upheavals in the, uh, in the weather patterns. So I've got one, now here comes the second one, and here comes the third, and the fourth. Then uh, going off into the distance, they become smaller, but they are still nevertheless there, and they're a little bit closer together because things that uh, recede get to be closer together. Anybody who has painted a fence or railroad ties understands that they become closer together as they, as they go off into the distance. Um, uh, there's a great deal of, of, of space to cover in this particular uh, ha this second part of this, um, of this study uh, and I have to be able to get to it and I can go back and refine this as the time wears out and the program comes to an end but I have to get for the most part the bridge on the pilings which were the point of this of this composition the uh, the uh, pilings in the foreground are, wha are what uh, are the interesting part of this particular, this is a crooked one, if that was crooked the bridge would fall down so you'd have to correct that as you as best you can. Uh, up here we have some more of the triangles and uh, some more of the verticals but uh, the, the lace work of this bridge is to be done with a lot of a lot of time and a lot of patience and probably a lot of deciphering about what you see but as I say it has to be an artistic um, uh, endeavor as well as a fairly correct architectural one. Um, the uh, the uh, Let's see, uh, yes, this one has a rather large uh, cross piece here, and this one's got all those amazing triangles. Bridges, of course, um, uh, 
we maybe because we uh, use them so often we take for granted uh, the only time that you really maybe don't take it for granted is when you have to pay an enormous amount of money to go across it and the the um the fees are becoming uh, uh more and more expensive because the maintenance of these bridges is becoming more and more expensive uh they get um they get battered and the uh, traffic patterns are absolutely uh, incredible on what what these bridges have to support in the way of activity uh, the the Chesapeake Bay Bridge of course is one of the longest ones in the east and um it costs i believe 6 dollars to go across that and you sort of swallow hard but then you realize that you're going a tremendous distance over water and it's very exciting so anybody who's going to be heading south see if you can't get into the Chesapeake Bay Bridge area and um and go across that amazing span uh so as the program comes to an end in a little you know far too short a period of time uh i'm going to be uh, i'll be refining this but that's for the general idea how you would approach the um the painting of this these are all anchored of course in the water with some dark areas and uh they uh they have to meet and it has to be it has to be correct but for the most part that's all i'm going to do on this now because i do want to get to the pilings the pilings are somewhat uh, somewhat important because they are in the foreground and the foreground of a painting can be made or broken with it with its pieces uh, a lot of people uh are not always sure that uh, the foreground is important but uh it's the part that the viewer sees almost immediately the background you sort of take in later but the foreground is the uh is the crucial point and the foreground on this one we laid it out i laid it out once before in part number part 1 so i'm going to have to lay it out again in this part and i'm just going to do it with some so what i call tinted turpentine to get the number of pilings and the placement of them there is one in the foreground here that bisects the um the the abandoned docks so i'm just going to place that here and it ends here and then it becomes water and then the reflection takes place below there and it's thicker than the other one It's actually quite high. It goes up uh it's almost well it's almost in the little bit beyond the middle of that of the uh, blue area in the middle ground. So on the, you have to lay these out. Don't start painting them first. They've got to be placed properly. Here of course is the um is the second one much further apart and it is almost underneath uh, the uh first piling of the bridge. That's the these are the points of reference that I keep talking about. And so Uh, underneath this and it's goes at an angle like so it, it, they recede into the distance uh something to be to to watch out for as you're if you work from life you have to you have to watch out for the um receding objects that become uh, smaller and at an angle into the distance if i lay if i put a guideline in there it's going to mess up the paint so i'm just not going to put the guideline in the second one that i have that is going the third one rather is somewhere in the middle of the of the pilings of the bridge back there i'm i'm telling you about this because the uh, the placement of objects is uh, made much simpler by using the points of reference uh this has to be a little bit further back there we go and so on down the line the next one is closer either because of perspective or because they in fact were put put closer together and the painting of them is going to come with very careful observation because they're not all gray and they're not all dark and they're not all uh they're not all perfectly straight there's one that goes off at an angle as a matter of fact and then there is one that is behind the other one so all of these things are part of the design and important if you're going to be recording something which is instantly recognizable if it's well done by the people who live there and of course the thing that one tries to avoid is to have people say where is that you are hoping that it is of course going to be recognizable immediately all right these pilings have a have a way of getting battered by the wind and by the weather and they become pale gray and in places sometimes even so bleached out that they tend that they have Uh, a lot of areas that are white uh, or whiteish but they are not great great big dark uh pilings that don't have shape they are uh, extremely interesting they change color they get darker as they uh, get towards the water the sun has done a job on their texture and they are also the resting place for gulls which are uh, part of any marine painting the gull is the, is one of the important 
components of anything to do with the sea. And uh, gulls, of course, as we know, uh, spend a great deal of time on pi here is on pilings. Here is the where this particular piling is dark on one side, and it sort of blends into the bleached part on the top, and it becomes quite dark down below. And it's got some white places and pale green, which is where it um, where it has become uh, um, well weather beaten by the water. Uh, sometimes there are some acids in the in the in this cre these creosoted logs that turn pale with certain conditions. I think that I would rather take off uh, the part that bulges out there, and that can be done with the palette knife this way. There we go. Okay. Um, the uh, the uh, the different uh, textures on these pilings are uh, to be observed. There is uh, the one that is closest to me has got some mussels and some marine life and barnacles growing on it, and it's also somewhat rusty toned because the creosote has apparently worked its way uh, out. And uh, so the observation of these is part of the whole uh, fascination of doing things as commonplace and as apparently as simple but really quite complex as these pilings in the water and if you do them right now most people are going to be really very interested because we do tend to not pay too much attention uh, in our daily lives about these things and if you do pay attention and render them, they suddenly uh, assume a whole different existence. They become uh, something uh, that makes people say, I didn't know those things looked like that. And that's the uh, role of the painter, to point these things out to the audience and to get them to have a renewed sense of observation. Uh, as Plato said, you know, observe, remember and compare and uh, I think that those uh, that's a piece of advice that has come down over the years to great advantage uh, I'll be right back I'm going to take a break for just a second so don't go too far away Uh, study of the Cap Tree Bridge, uh, one of the favorite places uh, somewhere here on the south shore of this island. And this, uh, this um, uh, network is now covering most of Long Island, I believe, possibly even all of it. And that's why we are going farther afield with the scenes. There was a time when where scenes were uh, merely within the viewing area. Now the viewing area has expanded and become uh, a much uh, more distant one. And that means that we can go to more distant places on the island and observe and uh, bring to you the, uh, the possibilities of painting endlessly all of the things that we live with every single day and possibly don't observe as carefully as it might be fun to do. So this program is, is in a way a travel log. It's to take you to places where you, uh, you know they're there but you haven't really bothered to go out and look at them extremely carefully. So uh, the, um, the need to be aware of the, of the place that we live in I think is evident, uh, especially when you go to exhibits of paintings by people whose business it is to go and uh, record things visually. Uh, the 
the buying of landscapes is far more often done than the buying of still life. Uh, I personally like them all. I don't, uh, I don't care what it is. If it's a good painting, it doesn't matter what the subject is. But for the most part, so landscapes are very appealing to people and painters who want to begin painting want to go out and paint what they call a scene. Well, a scene is a, is a perfectly acceptable term. A landscape is a good one. Seascape is another one. And mountainscape is one that has come into my vocabulary because I have moved to the mountains. I'm living in Virginia and I do mountainscapes quite often. So uh, the word scapes can have other uh, adjectives attached to them or nouns. Um, the, uh, the reflections, of course, are what make, uh, what make marine paintings what they are, and they are, of course, more fun than anything. And they will, they will happen in varying degrees of, um, of agitation. The water, usually, if it's, a, if it's a calm body of water, they are mirror images. If it's not a calm body of water, then it has uh, surface disturbances, and the, um, the uh, reflections become uh, wiggly, very interesting, and but they are never a formula. Never the formula that you will see on, uh, on some uh, demonstrational shows whereby they are all the same wiggle. Uh, they couldn't possibly be because the surface of the water changes all the time. However, the water reflections are what make you slam on the brakes and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do today. And as you can see, you prepare the background first, uh, namely the color that they go on. You do not paint around uh, the, uh, the, the so-called wiggles of the reflections. You would prepare the background. The paint will set s quickly enough for you to be able to go back to it. And if there is a break in the water, such as here, it probably is a break there. There is a chance that, for the, for, for, that um, the reflections will change as you're working on them. And that's nothing to, uh, to panic about. Uh, so does everything else change as you work on it. But um, observing the reflections is, is important for the authenticity of them. Uh, the whole thing of pulling a brush of color down saying, well, now that looks pretty good. That's not too bad. That's not what I'm after. I want it to be absolutely um, uh, mysterious of how you can get something as elusive as a reflection in water to be totally believable. And I have seen a lot of programs whereby uh, the painter has taken a brush full of color and has just pulled it down over the over the uh, thing and saying, well, there it is. That's not so. It doesn't happen that way. It can't. And um, uh, my patience is sometimes pushed to the bitter end when I see uh, that stuff going on. So maybe that's one of the reasons that I so obstinately drive uh, 700 miles to get here uh, to do this program, <laughs> just so that I can maybe put some of those ridiculous theories um, in a box and put away forever, never to be seen again. Here is the uh, Here are some of the refining things that that you do when you when you have the time and when you have the ability to observe what you're looking at and when you have the ability to decipher what it is that you're looking at now I see that there is a disturbance on the top of the water as this tape is is going and all of these all of these um, are becoming very indistinct these these uh, reflections are now being almost turned into a into a um, well, a gray pattern. There's no longer the uh, no longer the little uh, mirror image of those pilings. It's all become a little bit indistinct here. Uh, and one of the reasons that marine paintings are so interesting is that they are first of all they're extremely difficult to do, and secondly they have the possibility of, of enormous change. And uh, change is, I think, what everybody is after. Now, whether it's in a static painting on the wall or whether it's in the observation of these common place everyday things that we live with. The change is the, um, is the thing that we, uh, that we, that's why we do channel uh, surfing. Um, most people never sit in front of a TV and leave it alone. They are, go from one to the other because we're starved for change. And um, when, you, when you paint, you will find that if you work from life, that uh, desire to have change takes place all the time. Uh, things never remain the same and people move and I have a painting just in front of me over there that was done of this same bridge but there were people in front of it fishing and I believe that you may remember when I did that uh, there are people fishing and bathing and swimming and standing just in front of the bridge uh, the um, the uh, the interest of the bridge is not minimized by the presence of the people, but uh, there they are, and quite uh, quite intriguing it is to see 
the activity uh, on the, by the shoreline uh, with people as well as no people such as mine is. But there is a little bit of activity going on in this composition. There are going to be, I can probably find um, the camera was able to catch uh, a gull sitting, as I said, on the piling and possibly uh, the, um, the introduction of this gull w would be a nice idea. He's got a very white uh, head on him and uh, that's going to be done with a uh, absolutely pure, right out of the tube white. This, uh, and he sits, he's sitting right, let me see, let me see, where will I put him? I can put him anywhere because he will go to any one of these pilings at any time. Uh, the gull's uh, most distinctive feature is his brilliantly white head and his long and sometimes yellowish bill and then the rest of him thrown into very deep shadow because they're always in that wonderful deep dark area uh, uh, in the sunshine. The sunshine hits them very hard and their whiteness becomes quite dark uh, in shadow. Uh, they also have got uh, the darker part of the body here, his wing sticks out and then his tail is sort of silhouetted there and then barely visible as the foot that, su that, that supports him. But what is visible, of course, is a tiny, tiny eye. And that I'm going to do that with my very small brush. Um, the presence of living objects uh, is, 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 um, is important. I usually like to get people in, but birds can do, just the, do a job just as well. And I think that um, the, uh, the yellow on the beak is probably OK. I can probably introduce the yellow of the beak. Just slight, just a slight suggestion. And in, in refining a painting like this, I would probably do a great deal more study on this um, on this bird. Uh, but for the for the time that we have left, and for the time that I'm willing to devote to this, this is about enough. There's a little sort of a white suggestion here of something that is happening on the wing, and then his chest pulls out, and so he's he's rather handsome. Um, the, uh, the there is oh there's another one. So as long as one is good, two is better. So we'll just put another one on. Um, I'd like you to know that uh, there is going to be uh, many programs that are going to be going, as I said a little earlier, far afield, uh, farther afield than Brookhaven, which is where we were sort of confined to for a long time because we wanted to have this as a local origination station and we wanted to be able to give you, bring you things within the viewing area. Now the viewing area has been expanded and we have grown up and we're now going into, into other places. Um, I, we're going to be going further east and then again further west. So channel one is a, is a, is a brand new, uh, not brand new, but comparatively new uh, event here in our viewing area. Uh, and uh, I hope that everybody who is, um, who is aware of the fact is um, keeping up with the wonderful changes and the wonderful new things that are being done uh, on this uh, in this network. Um, I'm going to be coming back, uh, I come back uh, live on the last Tuesday of, of every month to do a show uh, with phone calls and uh, I'm hoping that you can sort of keep that in back of your mind that um, if you have any questions about what I'm doing or if you'd like to ask me how to do something else, uh, I'll be there to answer the phones of the last Tuesday of every month. Well, in the meantime, I'm going to refine this as the show ends. And thanks for watching. I hope that you got something out of it. Be sure to go out there and observe, remember, and compare. Bye-bye. This is Pat Windrow wishing you good rest of the summer.